Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. This is episode 65. We've got a really interesting program for you today with two feature interviews on two somewhat unusual topics. Yes. In the first interview with Tanya Ashton-Jones, we're going to learn all about Dorset buttons and how to make them. So Dorset button making is a heritage craft and Tanya tells us about the history of these handmade buttons. But what's really cool is by the time you finish watching the interview, you will no longer have any problems trying to find matching buttons for your hand knitted garments because you'll be able to make them yourself out of the same yarn that you use to knit your garment with. And that I think is really useful. So these buttons, they're all different sizes and you can put them everywhere. So not just on your garments, you can put them on your accessories, you can put them all over your project bags. And I think once you start making them, you won't ever stop. <laughs> so that's a lot of fun. And the second interview is with Frankie Owens. And Frankie's really passionate about Peruvian textiles. She went to Peru to learn their way of knitting with a Chequian Indian lady and she also belongs to the Peruvian textile study group in Cambridge. So Frankie's going to give us a demonstration on Peruvian knitting, but she also shows us some of their hand knitted accessories, which have really beautiful patterns. Some of the, their patterns date back to pre Inca times. And she shows us their hand spun and hand dyed alpaca yarn, which is also beautiful. And she shows us their very bizarre looking knitting needles. So that's a lot of fun. Yep. Our guest on new releases designer is Carol Sunday. And she's going to show us a design inspired by the pre-Raphaelite muse and model Jane Morris. But before that, we need to deal with the elephant in the room, Andrea, which is me. And that's going to be in Bring and Brag. <laughs> So I finally finished with Andrew's jumper. He's got it on. It's looking pretty good. I'm I'm actually pretty thrilled with the it's way it's turned out. It's very good, Giles. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but I am super glad to have it off the needles because I've done a lot of reworking with this design. So for new viewers, I took the original design, which was Jade Starmore's cardigan. It's a female cardigan. Um, and I turned it into a simple crew neck jumper for Andrew. And I thought that modification would be pretty straightforward but it didn't end up being like that for me because I had to work quite hard to take out the female elements that were written into the original design and just to let you know I think that all of the stocking stitch sections on the garment I've knitted twice and the gauge for the stocking stitch is 29 stitches and 41 rows per 10 centimetres or four inches. So that's a big deal to be ripping that back and, and re it. Yeah. So the reason why I've been so perf uh, perfectionistic about this is um, two reasons, actually. First of all, Andrew does wear all my jumpers. In fact, I'd say he's 300, year, 300 days in a year, yeah. you'd be wearing one of my jumpers. Probably. So that's a lot. That's a lot of jumper wearing. And I want to keep that up. <laughs> <laughs> I want him for, for two reasons. One reason is, is quite selfish. I want him to prefer to wear my jumpers. I want him to think that they feel better, that they fit better, and that they look better than a store-bought jumper. So I've got a lot of motivation to make them fit well for him. Secondly, since he is wearing them 300 days a year, I have to look at him in them. And if they do fit really well and the colour looks great on him, then it is a real joy to check him out 300 days in a year. Oh, dog, that's <laughs> nice. So actually two reasons are both quite selfishly yeah. motivated. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. I went out of that. You're into that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so... Let me tell you about my modification. So the stranded section, and if you sit up a sit bit up straighter, a bit you can see it on the body and on, on the sleeves. And I'll show you a picture of it later so you can see it really clearly because you can't see so much when, with him sitting down. But the pattern on the stranded sections is really simple. It's probably the most simplest fair, uh, stranded design I've ever knitted because it's only a three stitch repeat. So that was no problem. But because the material is different, always in stranded, you, it's slightly stiffer, um, thicker material, and, and the gauge is also different between the stranded sections and, and the stocking stitch. The stocking stitch section is more drapey and, and, and looser. Mm. So I have to be very careful when I'm thinking about my measurements to make sure that this doesn't look too drapey and this too stiff somehow. So I was very aware, with, aware of that. 
So the first thing that I always do to Andrew's jumpers is make the body of them slightly in a V shape and that's because he's narrow around the hips, he's got a completely flat tummy mm. and he's broad in the shoulders. Very broad shoulders. <laughs> So that's, that's a really sort of flattering shape on him. So that's what yeah. I'm doing. And that was all very well. But if you imagine that the stranded section is a bigger gauge than the stocking stitch, that means just to keep it even, even, the stocking stitch I have to increase. And then if I wanted to make it into a V, I have to increase it even more. So I did that, but I did it a little bit too much. And so it was a little bit too loose and blousy. Didn't like that. So I ripped it all the way back. And that was the reworking of this part, yeah. the second reworking. And it's sort of the same thing on the sleeves. And one of the feminine um, details that Jade wrote into the garment is to have it very tight fitting sleeves, which is what is fashionable in female garments now, but it's not something that's comfortable or that you'd want to see in a male garment that's maybe not extravagant. That's pretty classical. So I actually had to take the larger size um, to get a, a stitch count that would be loose fitting enough for Andrew down mm -hmm. here. But then a woman who has large down here is going to be larger in the upper arms than Andrew. So I, again, I had to make sure that that was, that was right. And the first time I did it, this was again too blousy. It was almost looking slightly leg of muttony. So I thought, oh, I have to, to rip that back. So I ripped that section back. That's the story of that. And then, of course, last episode, I told you that um, because Andrew is way broader in the shoulders than a size large woman, I had to totally rework the calculations for the shaping of the armhole and the set-in sleeve around the shoulders. And I, I talked you through how I did that. Well, the same went for the neck which was a surprise to me because I thought I would just be able to take the original calculations on the neck from Jade's uh, cardigan design and just transfer that straight over to um, a jumper. But, and I did that to start off with, but then I found that the front neck was a little bit too low. And again, that's, that's a really pretty design on a female cardigan. It looked lovely, but it just looked slightly odd on a classical crew neck jumper on a male. So that got ripped out. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually thought I'll show you really quickly how I reworked the neckline. And again, this is by no means meant to be a comprehensive guide on shaping necklines. Um, it's just going to show you a few points that you have to think about or that I thought about to make sure that I was going to get it all right. And of course, the stitch counts won't be relevant to you, except that it'll show you the proportions that I'm using. Yeah, or if you're making a jumper for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's a diagram that I made. And the very first thing you need to know is that the number of rows from the armhole shaping to the final cast off after the shoulder shaping needs to be exactly the same on both the front and the back. So make sure that you not only work out how many stitches you are decreasing over the neck and shoulders, but also how many rows you're decreasing those stitches over. Another really good point is the shoulder shaping on the front and back needs to be exactly the same. That's a little bit obvious, but I've just pointed out anyway. And you can see that I have 31 stitches on each shoulder, both for the front and the back, and I've cast them off in the same pattern. So that's 10, 10 and 11 stitches. As well as that, the total number of stitches cast off for the front neck and back neck sections are both the same. For me, they were both 58 stitches and the difference is simply how deep I've made the back neck and the front neck and how I've divided the stitches up to cast them off. So I made the front neck depth around eight centimeters and the back neck depth around two and a half centimeters. That's fairly average. It's possible that my front neck depth is still a little bit deeper than normal for a male crew neck jumper. For the back neck, I cast off an initial 54 stitches and then decreased two stitches on either side over six rows while at the same time doing the shoulder shaping. And for the front neck, I cast off an initial 36 stitches and then decreased 11 stitches on each side over 26 rows. Then I did the shoulder shaping after that, which added on another five rows. 
So you can change the shape of the front neck by changing the number of centre stitches that are bound off, either bound off or, or put on, or on hold, in the first row of shaping. If the initial bind off is a half or more of the total stitch count, it will create a wider neck. And that's what I've done because my initial cast off or, by, or, or the, the initial st stitches that I put on hold was 36 stitches, which is well over half of the 58 stitch total. And then of course you need to pick up the stitches and knit the neckband. And as you can see from this picture, Jade has mirrored the pattern on the cuffs and the hems with a three by three rib around the neckline. And she's put a few rows of reverse stocking stitch underneath and on top of the ribbing. I think that's a really cool looking um, detail. Because my neckline ended up being slightly too wide and deep for my liking and I really didn't want to unpick it all again and rework it, I actually worked my neckline a little bit longer to fill in the gaps more. Now here's some footage of Andrew wearing his uh, garment in our garden. He's looking gorgeous and glamorous. And the yarn, which I forgot to tell you about, is Alice Starmore's Hebridean two-ply. And it is right up there as being one of my very favourite yarns to knit with. I am really happy to be sitting here in my latest jumper. I know it was an enormous amount of work, Andrea. I have sat by, so thank you very much. I think it's really beautiful. I love the colours. I love the pattern. I think we've we've... You've turned it into a bloke's jumper. Good. I'm happy with that. <laughs> Not too many girly bits on it. No. <laughs> Feminine bits. And it is really interesting. I think this is the first stocking stitch, or maybe it's the most stocking stitch you've ever knitted for me. And it I do really notice the difference in the material here. It is significantly lighter than the colour work or even than the cables that yeah. you've used in other garments. So that's, that's good in the repertoire, to having the wardrobe to help me get those 300 days in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I think it's beautiful and I love, you know, I love the I think design. the colour looks great on you. Yep. And it is really soft wool. So Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm wool. sure I'm it's going to enjoy it and totally get a lot of use out of wool. it. The other part of the deal is, of course, that I now owe you a pair of socks. You do? This is technically a finished project. By the time this uh, episode goes out, this sock will be finished. There's only it's, a few more rows. It is one on the sock toe. and that does count as a project for me. Yeah, I've got twelve <laughs> rows to go. Um, it's the um, How I Knit My Socks by Susan B. Anderson. So just a very simple sock pattern. We've got heel flap and gusset and it's, all fairly um, straightforward. Top down. Top that's down. how I like it. Yep. That's yep. what Andrea orders every time. Um, it's a really easy knit now that I've practiced a few things and I've come off my glove project. So knitting a sock just round and round. Mostly. Yeah, you did this in record time. Yeah, record time. You said I <laughs> took two months for the last pair of socks. I'm not sure whether that's entirely true, but maybe it is. I reckon our viewers could confirm that. I think there was a bit of pain in there last time. So that's a good sign that I'm it actually is. getting better. And there's a lot less swearing going on. I think you right. find it quite relaxing now, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's a real sign that you're that's improving. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. So tell us about the yarn. The yarn is from Bendigo Woolen Mills, which is in Victoria. Bendigo is a little town in Victoria, which is... A city, a state. Yeah, okay, city. <laughs> Sorry, Bendigo. It's a city. Um, in Victoria, in Australia, which is where we come from. Yeah. So we're yeah, close by. And this yarn is actually a present, a gift from one of our patrons, Jill, in Western Australia. So Hi, Jill, Jill. There it is, turning into a beautiful sock for Andrea. So thank you very much. Yeah, they're going to be great and I'm looking forward to them. Yep. So coming up now is our interview on Dorset button making with Tanya Ashton-Jones. So enjoy that. <laughs> Fruity Knitting. I'm in Lerick, Shetland and with me today is Tanya Ashton-Jones who's also come up to Shetland to give a series of workshops during the Wool Week. And Tanya's passion is to teach other crafters how to make the traditional Dorset buttons and Dorset button making is a heritage craft and she's done a lot of research into the history of the craft which is fantastic and she enjoys teaching people about that too. 
And I think just as knitters, it's wonderful to be able to make our own buttons to complement our projects. So it's really great to have you here with us today to share your knowledge and skill. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. So let's start with just um, you telling us how you first got introduced to Dorset Buttons and yeah, and got hooked. Yes, yes, definitely. I grew up in Dorset, which is a county on the south coast of England, and I only actually learnt about Dorset Buttons fairly recently. So although I went to various school craft clubs and other craft clubs, it wasn't something that we were taught about at school. Yeah. I learnt to knit as a child. My nan taught me and I carried on knitting into my sort of teens and early 20s. And then sort of in my main adult years, I really did cross stitch. So a lot of cross stitch. And it wasn't until I had done a full career in the Royal Navy that I decided to pick my knitting needles up again. And picking up my knitting needles, I wanted to improve on the skills that I had. So I went away on a retreat. Um, first day, I was just totally amazed by everybody and this wonderful knitting and the language that was being used, words that I'd never even heard of in knitting. And that just set me off doing lots of different workshops, wanting to learn different textiles and yeah. uh, skills and techniques. And through a knitting group that I was part of, a chance opportunity came about to learn how to make a dorset button. And I remember the, the afternoon very, very clearly. A lady came along and showed us and we used thread. And in fact, this is the, the very first dorset button that I made. And... I loved it. I just loved how you could make such a beautiful, functional little piece. Mm. And that set me off on the path that I'm on today. And I went along to the, the Dorset History Centre in Dorchester and tried to find out a little bit more. And there was a couple of documents there. The, the history is quite sketchy, but there, were, there was something that sort of started me off. Yeah. And I found out that there was an old... Button Depot, which is now an antique shop, literally three miles down the road from where I was brought up and where my okay. parents still live. Yeah. So that got me going. And uh, yes, so I'm here today. I have my Dorset Button business called TJ Frog. And I now live on the Isle of Skye off the northwest coast yeah. of Scotland. And I love making Dorset buttons and spreading the word of this heritage craft. Well, they're pretty stunning and there's so much colour here on the table. Just for people who, who don't know where Dorset is, where is Dorset? Right, so it's on the very, very south coast of England. If you were to look at a map of England, if you see the Isle of Wight, it's just literally above okay. along that sort yeah. of area. So that's where it all started. So I think it'd be great if you can tell us a little bit of the history of the Dorset button. And there were a few different types that were made. Yes. So maybe just go through and explain what those types, those original types were and how, how they were made as well. Okay. The Dorset button industry dates back to the 1600s. Yeah. And it's believed that a gentleman called Abraham Case, who had been a soldier over in Europe, had seen people using thread and cloth buttons on their jackets okay. and he had come back to settle in England and in Dorset in particular and had seen there was an abundance of what were Dorset horn sheep mm -hmm. and the story goes that he was involved in originally setting up this Dorset button cottage industry so sort of around the 1620s the first buttons were made and the industry flourished for just over 200 years. And we had the electronic button making machine introduced in the sort of 1850s. And that gradually saw the decline. The end of it, yeah. yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then with the onset of the First World War, that really was the sort of whole... The finish of it. Finish yeah. of it. And okay. there was a lot of poverty in Dorset because of that. Um, it had employed a lot of people, mm. and so many people emigrated to the States, to Canada, and to okay. Australia. So that's the, the fundamental part of the industry. There were many towns and villages within Dorset that, where the buttons were being made. There were button depots, which I mentioned before, where people would go and deliver their buttons to. They would walk at the certain day that was uh, dedicated, drop off their buttons, and they would be given back materials to make more buttons. 
We know that they were classed into three different standards. There was sort of the superior quality, the, the seconds and the thirds, and put on different colour cards. And generally, it's thought that the lower quality were kept locally or in the UK, and many of the superior and finer quality were sent abroad and were worn by gentry and royalty okay. on their jackets. Yeah, and because it's inc- I'm just looking at them now, and it is so incredibly fine. Yes. We'll try to get some photos, but the, you can't believe it's humanly possible, actually, to do that embroidery. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got some examples here. What was the earliest one? Okay, so the earliest one we have is this one here, which is called the Dorset High Top. It's based on a slice of sheep's horn, so a disc of sheep's horn that would would be at the very base and then built up with fabric and all the way around an elaborate embroidery, which is fundamentally a sort of blanket stitch that goes around the top of the conical shape. And that would have been used on jackets to secure them. And that's not a replica. That there is the, is an original yes. from, from when, do you think? What, what I, I would period? say that would probably be around mid-1600s. Wow. Yes. Okay. And they were... Predominantly this sort of size, but I have seen smaller ones. And in order to see the embroidery on them, you have to look through a magnifying glass. You have to look through a magnifying glass. Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Which, bearing in mind that they didn't have the benefit of electric light like we do, know, you know, they incredible. would have been using candlelight probably or getting up early to get the best light of the day. Yeah. Okay. And what came next then, the... Yeah, so the, the Dorset knob, which are these two here, they were just a, a slight variation on the Dorset high top. So they're slightly rounder and they're flatter, but they still have that disc at the bottom of sheep's horn and still filled and then overlaid with the embroidery. So this would all be for gentry. They would be the only ones who could afford this kind of work. Probably, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what about these here? Okay, so... We move on to the what's called singletons. So these singletons are based now on a ring of soldered wire. So that's what's around the edge here. And then we have linen fabric that goes over the top. And often they were decorated in the centre with just tiny little French knots. And I think what gets me about all of these is just how tiny and small they were. Uh, the smallest ones I usually make are about a centimetre and a half, um, very similar to the earrings that I've got in. I've seen them as small as less than half a centimetre, you know, which is phenomenal. But here you've actually got the, the thread that they used and you can see just how fine yes. that thread is. Yeah. Um, so even working with embroidery thread today, that's still a lot thicker than something yeah. like this. Yeah. Okay, you can imagine, though, that they would be just a whole series of beautiful buttons down yes. someone's dress. Yes. Yeah, extraordinary. Yes. Down sort of the, the linen and the cotton and there's – smocking as well was, it was a, a skill that was also around at that time. So sometimes you can find – garments which have the smocking and then these little buttons on as well mm, okay. but quite hard to find and these are called wheels aren't they yes yeah, so we have a couple of others here we have the the wheels which were probably the the latest to be designed and which are really the ones that are being continued predominantly today and carried on there are what's called the Blanford Cartwheel, the Cross Wheel, and Old Dorsets. And I've seen the names sort of interchange slightly. And uh, yeah, so these would have again been on the soldered wire. Using the fine linen thread, this is actually a replica that, that I've made. But lots and lots of very thin threads based around that metal ring. And in a wheel shape, as you can see, very much looks like the spokes on a bicycle and there's just very variations on that yeah that's a pretty one and would they have done them also this small or not yes uh, that's extraordinary yes. yes and then they also did what were called bird's eyes which were softer so they had no hard form there was no metal there was no sheep's horn disc and a lot of these were used on children's clothes and historically what they would have done these would have used a piece of fabric which would have been twisted up okay. 
to make a ring that would have been stitched together and then they would have blanket stitched all the way around. So it's like a little mini ring donut, that's what okay. I sort of <laughs> call okay. it. Yeah. And so they'd, they'd be somewhat bendable then. Yes, yeah. yes. And these are just little replicas that I've made using some Shetland one-ply cobweb. So yes, much softer, much more pliable. And these are larger ones that I have made with wool. These ones, I've not used the traditional technique, so I've made this more contemporary. I've actually made that by using, I think I used a knitting needle, <laughs> but I used my finger just to show. So I would wrap wool around, pull that wool off so that you have a framework of a ring of lots of uh, strands of yarn and then blanket stitch all the way around. Okay. And again, yeah. it gives you that sort of ring donut yeah. shape. So those are fundamentally the four main, the hard form with the sheep's horn disc, the rings with the singleton and the fabric, the bird's eyes with no form in them, and then the rings with the various wheels. Great. And as we can see on the table, Tanya has her own style. And um, so I'd like you to sh go through now and show us, first of all, how do you get your inspiration? You know, when you're starting to make a button, what do you take your inspiration from? And then just show us some of the variations and the techniques that you've used to do your favourite pieces. Okay. I get inspiration from quite a few areas. So firstly, it might be the yarn that speaks to me <laughs> and particular colours. It might be from something that I've made and a feature within will speak to me. So yes, this knitted cushion, I just loved all the, the fun colours in it. And the name of this cushion, if I remember rightly off the top of my head, is Sugar Rush. So it was about sweeties and I just wanted... They look like sweeties. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to incorporate the colours and, and add those in. And little pearls. It looks great. That's, that's a bit of fun. So these three here are very much shawls that I've made and I've picked something from the design to use in the button brooch. So I'm very much uh, like to make button brooches when I make shawls. And this one here has got the just singular line in, which was to sort of represent these lines in the shawl. Yes, and also in that 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 line that comes down, it sort of looks variegated like the, the yarn yes. that's been used, yeah. Yes. And this one here was again about check the change between the purple and the lime green and using a chain stitch to represent the stitch that's been brought up through the pattern there. Yeah. That's great. And this one here this is a Shetland lace shawl and quite a bold brooch to go with it, but using all Shetland natural colours. Uh, so we've got little tiny cross wheels and then it's a double layer crochet base. Okay, have you done that on something? No. No, just two okay. layers of yes. crochets. And what about here? Okay, so one of the things I love is working with yarns that by hand dyers that have just been dyed beautiful colours. And I think the the wheel or the cross wheel just lends itself. It doesn't need to be anything more complicated in the design because it just shows off the colours that the hand dyer has done beautifully. Mm. So that's mm. something I really do love to do. I also enjoy using natural colours. So two natural colours here just used to, to complement one another. I love using beads, so I love a bit of sparkle. <laughs> and this one here, so again, a hand-dyed yarn, lots of different blues in it. And I've just put onto there four different coloured beads. So we've got white, we've got silver, glass and a turquoise. And they've just all been put in there quite randomly to, to really just complement and draw out the colours in yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I like to make sort of quite fine, but also quite bold pieces as well. Uh, this is just a quite a chunky natural dyed yarn and then this one here which is a variation on the dorset button so I've used the the fundamental techniques but I've just changed it slightly to make it a bit more contemporary and that's okay. got beads, yeah. beads in so too. Perhaps show us a construction if you can of, of um, yeah a typical wheel Okay, so we start off with a ring and I 
mainly use these little metal rings. Sometimes I use wooden rings. You can also use plastic rings. For making the button, you can use any yarn or thread. Some people use ribbon. Really, it's anything that you feel would, would make a great button. So I'm using some, some yarn here. And we start off by covering the ring with blanket stitches or what some people might know as a buttonhole stitch. And we're just going to go through the ring, just pulling the yarn through and pulling that stitch. And that's what we're doing all the way around the ring. And that gives it up. a tiny little edge also right around the edge, doesn't it? Or do you put that in the center in the end? Yes, what we do eventually is when this is all covered, we actually turn this so that it sits right at the very back of the ring and it's just hidden. So you can just see on this one where that's okay, hidden yeah. there. Now, that's traditionally what you would see on the buttons, but that's not to say that you have to do that now. That could be part of your design feature where you leave that ridge yeah, on the outside yeah. making buttons today. So once that's covered, we then have to, and we've pushed that all in, which is called slicking. So we've made it nice and slick. We're then going to make the framework in the center on which we're going to work. And what we're doing here is we're laying down spokes. So we talked earlier about this looks very much like a bicycle wheel. Mm. And really that's what we're doing. We're just winding the yarn around so that we get these spokes that we're going to build our pattern and design onto. Yeah, so that one there has been done in a different colour against the, the colour that was used on the ring. This one's been used in the same colour. Then once the spokes have been made, there's a tiny little cross stitch that's put into the middle, which just helps anchor those spokes. And it also aligns the ones front and back, because of course you've got spokes front and behind. Okay, yeah. Then it's making our design in the middle. And one of the misconceptions is that this is woven, as in sort of over and under. But what we're actually doing is we're doing what's called rounding. And it's a series of back stitches. So we're going around the front okay. and corresponding back spoke. Okay, so you're going under and over. Under, under and, and over, over. Yes. right around. Yes. So when you have Good old gone, trusty back stitch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so when you've gone over and under, over and under, all the way around every spoke, the first time, that's your first round complete. Okay. Yeah. So the, these two that we're both holding here, these have both gone over a single spoke and given that particular design. But what you can do is now that you've got that as the basis, you can change the number of spokes that you lay and the number of times or spokes that you go around for your back stitch, and that will start to give you different designs. Okay. So for example, this one here, which I call the sort of flower design, I have started off right at the center, going over just one spoke like this one, just for a couple of rounds, and then I've changed it and I'm actually going over two spokes so my back stitch is going over two spokes back behind those back behind the next two and coming up around and that now uh, gives yeah. me a I've wider yeah. yes yes and then this one here which gives a, a spiral so I've gone here over three and then back behind one so I've gone over three spokes, behind one, over three, behind one. So I'm making okay. it a much longer stitch. Yeah. And yeah. it's given this spiral effect. So you can really play around with variegated yarns very well here. Exactly. Happy. Yes, yeah. exactly. That is amazing. That looks so beautiful. It's quite different, strong um, contrast in the colours, but they just come out so well here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I really do. Yeah. It's one of my favourite. Okay, so as I said, Tanya's here to give workshops and she really loves doing that and she gives workshops at quite a lot of knitting festivals. Uh, but I'd imagine that most of your students have never done this before. So how do you start off a beginner and what are their typical challenges that yes. they first of all face? Okay, <laughs> well, we start off using one of the rings and start off with 
laying this blanket stitch around. So you're starting off always with the wheel. Always with easier? the wheel. Yeah. Yes, because I think if you've got those four basic techniques, which is putting that blanket stitch on, which we call casting, so a bit like casting your knitting on, you've slicked the ridge and then you lay the spokes and then you do the rounding. I think if you can get those four techniques practiced, it's then really for you to take it away and play with it in yeah. terms of... Yeah. Of making Number. fun and yeah, and making it fit your project. Yes, yeah. yes. So I think one of the the main challenges is when people start off is laying this first blanket stitch. It's actually getting a nice tension on it. It's a little bit like knitting, <laughs> getting the right <laughs> tension. Um, because if you leave it too baggy, yes. what will happen is you will start to see the ring through and it's ugly it's got to look it's got to look like a satin stitch doesn't it in a way yes. it's got to be smooth exactly yeah. yeah so that's usually one of the first things is just getting a nice tension on that so that you get fairly even stitches that look good so not sort of baggy mm. baggy stitches the next thing I think which is probably the hardest is laying the spokes and when I teach workshops I tend to use a large ring like this polystyrene ring that, that I prepare just to help people because obviously working with a very small ring it's very fiddly <laughs> and laying the spokes is probably from the feedback I get the bit that people find the hardest. hardest yes and even me now all the buttons that I've made you know sometimes I will lay them and think oh no that's not not good I need to redo it but there's little tricks that you can do if you're not okay. happy so we lay the spokes and when I teach I tend to get people to think about a clock face mm -hmm. so I think about 12 spokes and having that analogy I think helps people just to see where the to spacing. lay them and to yes. easily space them evenly exactly yeah. yes so using this really is just a way of showing people and if you're not happy with how your spokes are so for example if I'm not happy with this spacing here you can just take your needle and just put it under your spoke and just prise it along. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little. So there's ways in which you can move those spokes if you're not entirely happy. And quite often your sort of centre will move as well and you just give it a good old tug, you know. Yeah, it, to it keep will it fall centred. Yeah. Into place. Yes, and then we just really work on making those stitches... That will go around that will give us thank you give us our pattern and design so now you're just doing a simple back stitch is that right is that yes. what you're planning yeah yes. I was just going back on myself and I just quickly want to show this because uh, Tanya has these button um, making kits don't you and at all the directions in here, like if you yes. were a beginner, could you, a confident beginner, just read through and, and have a good go at it yourself without a class? Yes, yes. That's great. So written instructions, there's also drawings as well to show people and all the materials are there as well. Great. And Tanya is also working on a book. Sounds exciting. So just tell us briefly a bit about the book. When is it due to be published? And um, and are you also going to incorporate any stories, of historical stories of, of um, button makers? Or have you been able to find out anything about that? Okay, so the book will due to be published next year, spring next year. It's, as I mentioned before, some of the history is really, really quite sketchy. So there's lots of research at museums, newspaper articles, speaking to other people who are doing research in the Dorset button industry and one particular uh, avenue that I've spent quite a bit of time on is, is what was this previous button depot near where my parents were because that's near an estate and the Lees family were very active in the Dorset button making industry in the, in the 18 and 1900s and some of the original buttons from there went to the, the button antique shop and also went out to the States. And so thread buttons, which they're quite often called in, in the, the States, so made out of the, the thread on the ring, and yeah, some of the buttons went there at the end as well. So just really trying to connect with people and museums and places to see what we can 
add into the book to well, bring Well, good for you. It's great when, when that you've got a passion for it and you're able to spread, you know, to teach other crafters how to do it, to keep it a, an alive craft. That's the most important thing, isn't it? It is. I think for me, being able to pass on a little bit of history in workshops, pass on the basic techniques and to encourage knitters and makers to think about how they can use them to add that finishing touch to their own handmade items. That's what gives me a reward, is yeah. seeing people take that on and forward. Yeah, great. Mm. Well, thank you so much for being on Fruity Knitting to share your skills and knowledge with us. We're very grateful. <laughs> thank you very much, Andrew. It's been great. Thank you. Good. Let's say goodbye to the viewers. Bye. 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 buttons completely stunning they looked so beautiful and bright all laid out on the table like that yeah it was good it made you just want to put your hands in them and, yep. <laughs> and play with them all so I think it's really cool that you can make all different sizes and did you see the big size that she'd put on just a single big button on the, on the front of a hat yep. that looked really cool and on the shawls and you can do little buttons all in a row on a cardigan or tiny button earrings to match your hand knitted jumper yeah, you're completely flexible. Yeah, endless possibilities. So we do have a four-minute tutorial of Tanya showing us the four steps in making a dorset button. So that's casting, that's slicking, laying the spokes and rounding. And that's available for our patrons. And your patrons, you'll find that on the Patreon site under tutorials. So enjoy looking at that and learning about it. Tanya is also offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount off everything in her online store. And that includes her Dorset button making kits, but also ready-made Dorset wheel buttons as stitch markers or as earrings. She has project bags and she also has her own yarn. Tanya has a limited yarn range called Shorelines and Strata, which is a mixture of pole dorset wool with a little bit of Hebridean wool. The mix is 85% pole dorset and 15% Hebridean. Yep. So for those of you who are into breed-specific yarns, I think you might want to check that out. So I'm now doing a very new kind of project, a different type of project. It's this lovely, elegant, luscious red lace. Do you like it? Yeah, it does. It's very nice, but I just want to check. This is not for me, right? No, it's no. not for you. Okay. It's for me. So it's a design by Louisa Harding. Here's a picture of it. And as you can see, it's a very elegant, dressy kind of um, garment um, in a beautiful all-over chevron lace pattern with elegant stripes. So I'm going to tell you more about it in the next episode when I've done some more work on it, but that's just the start of it here. Um, the, the construction of it is bottom up in pieces. So first of all, you knit the front and the back from the bottom up to the armholes, and then you knit the sleeves and then knitted flat up to the armholes. And then you join all four pieces together and you knit the raglan decreases. So it's a fairly easy construction. After that, you sew up the seam on the body and sew up the seam on the armhole. So that's pretty easy. The difficulty is making sure that you've got the right size. Because it's an all-over chevron lace pattern, the row count is just as important because you've got those lovely stripes here on the bodice and they have to be, you have to have enough, make sure you're going to have enough depth in your armhole. So I've been doing a fair bit of swatching and I really hope I've managed to do that correct. It would be just a dream to be able to knit a garment without doing any ripping back at all. That'd be amazing. I can't <laughs> actually ever remember that having happened. That has happened. Yeah. Has. Yes, it has. It has happened. Okay, so I wasn't sure. The, the, the yarn, by the way, is Louisa Harding's yarn. It's her beautiful 100% cashmere gilly yarn. It's totally beautiful and she has a, a, an amazing color range. But I wasn't sure which colours to do my um, version of the design in. I was really drawn to this beautiful, luscious, red, bright red, orangey colour. But I wasn't sure what to pair it with. So, to my complete amazement, 
which totally blew me away. Louisa knitted up this swatch for me and sent it over. And she's paired it with this other color here, which is a deeper, um, a deeper red. And I think it just looks stunning together with it. Don't you? Yes. yes. That completely blew me away. So I'm hooked on it. And that's what I'm knitting with. So these yarns, they've got two colors that have been loosely plied together and that gives it a heathery depth. So this one is quite a bright sort of orangey red with a, with a more muted darker red. And so that's that one. And this one has, has got the red in it is almost um, burgundy, you could say. It's a very blue red and it's been paired with a gray thread. And the gray is actually very warm. It's almost a brown gray. And so you put them both together. And what I love about it is that they just very slightly clash and it makes it so interesting and so elegant. Yep. So I'm really thrilled. This is a different project for me. It's a, a different type of garment and yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. So I look forward to telling you more about it as it goes along. It should be a fairly quick knit provided I don't rip it out. <laughs> <laughs> so last Saturday we had a really great live event with Louisa for our Shetland patrons and this coming Saturday we have another live event with Meg Swanson for our Shetland patrons. Yeah, we interviewed Meg Swanson who is the daughter of Elizabeth Zimmerman back in episode 57. Meg's love of knitting is just as deep as her mother's was and she has developed some very interesting techniques of her own, particularly in the area of colour work knitting. Meg has a wealth of knowledge and experience so this will be a fantastic opportunity to talk to her and ask her all of your questions. So Shetland and Merino patrons, please send in all your questions in advance so I can get them over to Meg to look at before the live event. Yep. And right now it's time to get up and stretch our legs and go for a walk. Yep, we're going to be taking in some autumn scenes, so enjoy this. We'll be right back. <laughs> I'm Carol Sunday and I'm excited to be sharing with you my new sweater design, Jane Morris. So Jane Morris, the person, was the wife and muse of William Morris, who was one of the founders of the arts and crafts period of the late 1800s. Jane was a beauty and uh, she was also a skilled needleworker. She was an embroideress. And besides inspiring her husband's work, she was also the muse to other poets and painters of that period, so she was kind of a pre-Raphaelite it girl. Anyway, her husband, William, was a designer of, among other things, patterns for wallpapers and fabrics. His designs are beautiful and distinctive, and they've inspired me in a number of my projects, including the lace panel that I designed for the front of Jane Morris, the sweater. 
So the sweater is knitted in one piece from the top down. It starts with provisional cast-ons along the shoulders. The front is knitted straight down in stockinette stitch and lace. It has a bateau neckline with a little bit of a scoop, and that's by virtue of the stitch pattern itself. There are no short rows or anything. The back, similarly, is knitted straight down with a little lace motif along the back shoulders and then stockinette stitch. And then the sleeves are picked up and knitted to the wrist. So the construction's really simple and straightforward. And the shape is really simple too. It's big and boxy in the body, slender in the sleeve. And for this sweater to fit nicely and drape beautifully when it's worn, it's really important that the fabric be light and airy. You can see this is almost a sheer uh, knitted fabric. Uh, which I achieved by working at a worsted weight gauge, but using a sport weight yarn. Um, the yarn I used for my sample is from my own Sunday Knits line of yarns. It's called Heaven. It's 100% cashmere, so it's yummy. Um, the fibers are humanely sourced and harvested, of course, and uh, the color is called Marsh. So one thing about the uh, lace panel itself, um, Traditionally, laces of this sort are worked with the increases and decreases done on both the right side and the wrong side of the fabric, which is how I knitted my sample. But when the sweater was in test knitting mode, uh, one of my test knitters found that working the lace on the wrong side was just more complicated than she was interested in doing. And uh, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful and maybe I could come up with a method for uh, achieving the same results but by working the lace on just the right side. So I did that um, by using afterthought yarn overs along with regular yarn overs and double decreases and drafted a second set of charts. So with your Jane Morris pattern, you will get two sets of charts to choose from. You can either work from the traditional chart or from the new right side only chart, whatever suits your knitting style, the results should be quite the same. I hope you'll enjoy knitting and wearing your Jane Morris. Thank you, Carol. I think Carol's design was completely stunning. Yep. Just so elegant and so beautiful. I loved the lace panel at the front, the way it was inspired by William Morris's wallpaper. I think the natural shaping of the lace, the way it naturally shaped itself around the front neck was really clever. And the back, the little bit of lace at the back yeah, neck. Yeah, the bit at the back is really elegant, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and yep. unusual. I, yep. I'm totally, um, yeah, completely You're impressed, impressed yes. by that design. I think it's stunning. Carol has a lot of great design. She's very experienced and she's got a fantastic collection, so you should really go and check out all of her designs. But getting back to William Morris, I also love William Morris's wallpaper. In fact, here's a picture of my music studio. This is where I used to teach singing and piano. I loved his wallpaper so much that I plastered it all around the studio. And I used to look at it thinking that it would be really great to translate elements of it into a colour work design. So it's quite funny that she was inspired by it as well. Mm -hmm. So Carol, like I said, is a very interesting designer. She's got some really beautiful designs. She's prolific in, in what she's put out there, but she's also got a really great uh, yarn range. Uh, her colour range of her yarn is phenomenal. There's so many shades in every possible colour. It, they've all been spun at a very good quality uh, spinning mill in Italy and they're woolen spun and they're soft enough to wear against bare skin. So that's all very exciting. And Carol has offered Fruity Knitting patrons a discount of 25% of all self-published patterns in her Ravelry store. And she has a ton of beautiful designs, so enjoy looking at them. And 15% discount of her yarns and her kits on her website. So that's an amazing offer because she really does have a huge choice available in both her patterns and her yarns. So enjoy looking through her website and her Ravelry store. And patrons, you can find the details of the discount on the Patreon site. So we're just about to get on to our second interview, but before we do, it's time to talk about becoming a patron. We are working at this consistently seven days a week. It's very intense work for us. 
So if you are enjoying the show and watching regularly, please do become a patron. It's very inexpensive to become a patron. You'll get some great rewards. And most importantly, you're ensuring that this show continues. Yeah. And thank you so much to all of our wonderful, generous patrons for supporting the show so far. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Coming up now is our second feature interview. It's with Frankie Owens and it's all about Peruvian knitting. So enjoy that. We'll be back with you in two weeks' time. Thanks for being with us today. Bye. Bye. to Fruity Knitting. We're going to learn a lot about Peruvian knitting today with a lady who's very passionate about the subject. So let me introduce you to Frankie Owens. Frankie, it's great Hello. to have you on Fruity Knitting. <laughs> it's my pleasure. <laughs> Frankie is originally from Wales and it's almost by accident that she came across Peruvian knitting when she was on a tour in Peru with her daughter. And since then, she's become quite the expert on the subject. She's involved in a Peruvian textile study group in Cambridge, where she's presently living. And she's also here to teach classes on Peruvian knitting during the Shetland Wool Week, which is great. And you've just finished your two classes, I haven't have. you? And they were successful. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yes, That's people good. are very enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah. So, Frankie, you've been a really keen knitter and spinner for most of your adult life. Just start by telling us that introduction that you had to Peruvian knitting on that textile tour, wasn't it? That's right. Well, when I retired, having been a biology teacher uh, all of my working life, um, I decided that I was going to treat myself by a go on a textile tour to Peru because I had heard so much about how wonderful their weaving uh, was and their textile artistry. Uh, so I signed up with my daughter to go on a tour done by Puchka, Peru, and there were three workshops on the textiles tour uh, that you could sign, that you could do, and one of them was Peruvian knitting. Now, even though I've knitted since I was ten, I had never heard of Peruvian knitting, so I signed up for that immediately. And when I arrived at my workshop class, the first thing I saw uh, laid out for us to see were these absolutely wonderful uh, socks uh, knitted by my teacher. And uh, I was immediately struck by how beautiful they were. First of all, by the colours, yeah. which are lovely. Uh, and then also by the patterns, which I liked a lot as well. Then, of course, I picked them up and they feel beautifully soft because they're knitted in alpaca. And then, like all knitters, when you pick something up that's been hand-knitted, you look at the back. And when I looked at the back, I was truly amazed because these socks were knitted without a single float, yeah. even though the patterns are very complicated. Uh, so I immediately wanted to know how this had been done. My teacher was a Ketchon Indian lady called Rafina Huaro, who'd come from a village high up in the Andes in the north of Lima, uh, where there is a lot of knitting going on. Knitting also goes on a lot around Cusco, but Rufina was more from the north. And um, she had no Spanish, let alone English. She only spoke Quechon. And I didn't even have Spanish, so that wouldn't have been much use either. But uh, so... The workshops were all demonstration based, but that proved to be extremely effective. Yeah. And, uh, and we started on the workshops and I absolutely loved Peruvian knitting um, from the moment I started on it. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. So she just showed you, she just demonstrated mm. it slowly and, and you could catch on. We could copy. Yeah. That's right. So Frankie's also been learning a lot about the history of Peruvian knitting. So you've got to tell us a little bit of the history and then how it's used now in the present culture. Yes. Well, I was very fascinated by this technique, which involves having the yarn around your neck and knitting with your thumbs. 
And when I got back to the UK, uh, I did some research on it and found out that, in fact, the Peruvians uh, didn't have any true knitting before the Spanish arrived in the 16th century. The only type of knitting that they did was a sort of null binding called cross-knit looping with one threaded needle. And they used that to make uh, edgings, very pretty edgings, but they're not a bit substantial. Because the Peruvians were expert weavers and that yeah. was their technique. Yeah. But when the Spanish arrived with the then European style of knitting, uh, they, uh, the Peruvians very quickly uh, took it up and, and continued to develop it. They thought that probably the Spanish missionaries may have taught them this technique, or maybe the wives of the um, conquistadors might have, might have taught the locals. But whatever it was, they rapidly um, became extremely adept at it and developed it. And it produced garments or small accessories which were very suitable when done in alpaca for the climate in the high Andes because okay. it is very warm. Um, but this type of knitting actually died out to a large extent in Europe. So in the 18th century, um, German continental knitting was developed, the 1800s rather. So nobody quite knows, but it, continental knitting took over. So this just stayed in isolated regions, did it? And mm. then developed? Yeah, so in Europe, this stay, you can still find it mostly in Portugal, mm. uh, where they sometimes also have a pin yeah. around the, to, to tension the yarn rather than the yarn around the neck. Um, but I've also come across it in uh, the Azores, in Greece, in Albania, small little areas. Some of the older people in the villages still use this technique. But in South America, it is the, in Peru and Bolivia, it is the main type of knitting. Uh, and there it has uh, developed and thrived. So how are they using it now in the villages? Who's knitting? What kinds of things are they knitting? Yes, it's not really a terribly suitable technique for knitting large garments like jumpers okay. uh, because it is it's quite thick and it's inelastic and it's not as quick as continental knitting but it, that doesn't matter for the Peruvians because their clothes are usually made of their woven materials yeah, yeah. so it's used for accessories as you can see here we have socks we have bags we have leg warmers um, gloves those are the sort of things that this knitting technique is very good for. Um, and so the Peruvians like it for those because the fact that every stitch is wrapped at the back gives you a double thickness fabric. And in alpaca, that's very warm. Yeah. And the children knit as well, and the men. What can you tell us about yeah, the, so the family the... situation here? <laughs> Uh, the men and women knit in Peru, and it depends on the area. In some areas, like Lake Titicaca, uh, men knit, and they knit the, the fabulous chewers or hats that, that are in that area. In other areas, women knit, and in other areas, men and women knit. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of no gender bias, really, mm -hmm. uh, about knitting in Peru. It can be either men or women, and yeah. often depends on the village or the area. And the children start early, don't they? Yes, they do. They start, though, with spinning when they're about four with the drop spindle and they go on to little braids. Um, but perhaps they'll start knitting when they're, you know, before they're, they're ten. Okay. So you said um, spinning and we've got a drop spindle here. Tell us about the yarns. How are they made and, and what kinds of fibres? Are they blended or...? Yes. The, uh, the main, there are two main fibres that they use, alpaca and wool but they don't blend them. Okay. The alpaca is by far the best fibre. Um, alpaca is a member of the camelid family, yeah. so belongs to the llamas, guanacos, vicuñas. Uh, the the fibre quality is worst in the llama and best in the vicuña. Vicuña is only used for weaving, uh, but alpaca, as I expect a lot of knitters already know, is extremely good for knitting. Uh, so they use alpaca. Um, and the other one that they use is, is the wool, but the wool is a far less good quality. It's quite coarse wool. Their sheep is called the Creole, 
and it comes from developed from the Spanish chura sheep, which the conquistadors brought over. And it's neither, it's a mountain breed, it's not terribly good either for wool or for meat, really. But, okay. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> but okay, they, but they, do, <laughs> they do use it, but it's nothing like yeah. as good as the alpaca. Okay, so it has a long fibre, does it, or a short one? It's, or... uh, yes, it's quite long fibred. Okay, yeah. and mm. do you know if the yarn is woolen or worsted spun with? Yes, the, the technique that they use is a double drafting technique, which gives you a semi-worsted yarn. Um, this is a drop spindle that I bought in Chinchero Market. And although it looks a fairly crude drop spindle, it works extremely well. You see the Peruvians spinning uh, all day long as they go about their everyday business. They spin when they're going to market, they spin when they're looking after the animals, they spin uh, when they're keeping an eye on the children. Uh, they're always spinning and doing something with their hands as a secondary occupation, really. So Some, just while they're walking? Just what? Yes, as yeah. they walk along. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, but they... Uh, so they don't have spinning wheels? No, no, I was just... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say some American charity thought that might help them if they brought them spinning wheels. And so they took some to some of the villages. But it, they didn't go down very well with the local people because in a, with a spinning wheel, you are set in one spot with your wheel. And that isn't how the Peruvians spin, they're, because they're continually doing it all day while they're doing something else. Yeah. So the spinning wheels very rapidly went into disuse. And also people think, well, spinning wheels are faster at spinning, but actually the Peruvians are so good with drop spindles that that's not actually that much faster. Okay, they're so it wasn't very a fast. big advantage. There was no, no advantage and they didn't like them. This is the alpaca yarn that um, my teacher, Rufina, gave us for the workshops. And, and it is really worth seeing because it is actually three strands of two-ply. The singles are extremely fine. So it's six-stranded and then very, very loosely plied. Okay, let's have a look. It is loosely plied, isn't it? Mm. For weaving, the Peruvians... Uh, over twist the singles and and very heavily over twist when they ply because they need a really strong yarn yeah. for their backstrap looms. But for knitting in the alpaca, you have this very very soft um, and what you might call underplied yarn. Okay. But it is absolutely lovely to knit with. But it takes a very long time for her to produce. And when I asked her if I could take some back with me, she was slightly reluctant. <laughs> Because she really didn't want to lose it. But she, I, I did manage to buy a small quantity, which I now treasure. <laughs> yeah, so the, but the colours are really beautiful too. Is that they natural? Are. They are, yes. They use cochineal a lot. Cochineal is a, a dye derived from beetles that live on prickly pear cactus. And it gives the most wonderful range of colours from sort of pinks, to purples, to reds. I haven't got a red, but it gives a really beautiful red colour as well. Because uh, cochineal is an indicator and it changes colour with pH very easily. And so if you alter the acidity of your dye bath, you get all this different range of colours. It's incredible that you can get that bright red mm. and, and these colours. Yes, yes, and, very, and also very... Even paler lilacs than this you can get as well. Great yeah. range of colours. The other dye, well, that's indigo. They, they've imported indigo for a long time. Yeah. Um, but there's some of the other colours, um, that's probably yellow uh, over dye, uh, indigo over dyed with yellow yeah. or the other way around. The, uh, but some of the other natural dyes that they were using when I went to a uh, dye workshop, I couldn't recognise the plants uh, or their names because they were all in Ketchum. And they didn't have a Latin equivalent, but um, they were getting a wonderful range of colours with their natural dyes. And you told me that there was a lady there who was really encouraging them to use the natural dyes, that they had gone on to try to use the synthetic dyes and she was bringing back mm. to try to keep that tradition. So tell us quickly about that. Yes, well, um, uh, Nilda Calanoapa Alvarez, who set up the centre for traditional textiles, 
uh, together with other ladies in Chinchero, she has greatly encouraged the use of natural dyes because synthetic dyes came into Peru and the Peruvians love really bright colours uh, and so they took up with them. But they don't suit the, the, the natural style of knitting and weaving. The, the subtlety of the natural dyes are far, far better when you see them being used. And Nilda has done a wonderful job on encouraging uh, the villagers and the other artisans to go back to using natural dyes. So yeah. that's, a very, that's a good news story. Okay. So you're all probably dying to see um, Frankie do some knitting. And she's going to show us, first of all, some Peruvian knitting just with a, a single strand and then with uh, two hands. So like two-handed knitting, aren't you? Two, color, two, two yarn colour work. I am. <laughs> okay. So let's have a look at that. The Peruvians knit nearly always with pearl. They use knit very, very occasionally. And they pearl uh, the, with the wrong side of the fabric facing them and always in the round with four needles. The, this, when you're using two colours and you twist the yarns with each stitch, this gives a very firm fabric which is very inelastic but also very warm. So when you're using it for things like hats up in the Andean mountains, it is a, a wonderful um, fabric to keep the wind out in the cold conditions. Yeah, I just wanted to say quickly that um, we're in, during the Shetland Wool Week here and last year I took one class and it was two-end knitting and that was all about doing the same thing, an old Swedish me method. And for the same reason, they didn't do garments out of it, they did arm warmers, leg warmers, hats and to create a very stiff sort of windproof fabric. So, yes. It's interesting. So yeah. it's the same idea. Yeah. Mm. The yarn goes over the neck, comes down the left shoulder to the needles and you tension it around your neck. The yarn is quite sticky um, and holds quite well with tension and you manipulate the yarn with your thumbs. Your thumbs have to be free for this technique. It's the thumb that takes the yarn over to make a conventional purl stitch. This is a very easy way of purling and for some people, uh, if they have problems with their hands, it's good. Do they use the knit stitch often? They, if, when they knit, they use a continental style of knit. But they, they, they don't knit much and they don't use knit and purl to make patterns on the fabric. So when you're using two colours with, with the, to make patterns, you have your main colour coming up over your left shoulder and your uh, pattern colour coming up over your right shoulder with both balls of yarn on your lap. This gives you a V coming down to the needle, which really is very important because looking at that tells you when you have to cross the yarns over. So for this stitch, which I'm coming up now, is green, if I just knitted it, I would leave, start to leave yellow behind and get a float. So I have to wrap green around the yellow and up underneath it and make the stitch with the green. This time green is twisted, that's fine. Yellow can come underneath as I'm doing three green, one yellow. This technique means that when you look at the back of the work, there are no floats at all and you get this double thickness fabric, which as we've said before is, is just brilliant for the conditions that the Peruvians live in. With a chilly wind. With the chilly winds <laughs> blowing on the Andean plain. I think it's pretty good for the shallow <laughs> conditions too. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, so you're using normal DPNs, but I can see some different kinds of needles here. So tell us something about these needles. When I was doing my workshop in Peru, we were given these needles and these are made, these are metal needles as you can see, and they are made by, of bicycle spokes. The Peruvians do this because this is an inexpensive way to make a needle and they also like to have a hook on the end. So they double up really as a crochet hook as well. But they're not the easiest needles to use. They're quite coarse, quite harsh. With the hooks on the end, with this yarn that has got six singles in it, it can be very easy just to miss picking up one of these little strands. Uh, 
and and hook out a loop. Yeah, that's right. And then you get a nasty little loop on the outside <laughs> when you look later on, which is very annoying. When you took your knee, uh, knitting needles there, what did they think of yours? Oh, well, they love our knitting needles. Do they? Yes, they do because they're so smooth and they're easier to use than these. So and it's a good present for a Peruvian knitter to take some of our needles out there. Those That charity should have given them needles yes, and not a should. spinning wheel. Yes, wheel. absolutely. <laughs> these, though, are the finest needles that the Peruvians use. And... These needles are used by young ladies when they want to knit a hat for their fiancé. And they can get up to 26 stitch stitches per inch on these needles. By using such fine needles and making such a, uh, a wonderful fabric, um, that's a sign of the love you have for your fiancé. So we haven't talked about patterns yet, and they're very colourful. And the motives and patterns, are they connected to their spiritual beliefs or...? Yes, but the patterns are extremely important to Peruvians. Many of the patterns in, you see in the knitting are actually patterns that they've had in their weaving since pre-Incan times and okay. are very ancient patterns. They can also be patterns that are particularly associated with an area. Um, and you see hats knitted with particular patterns which can tell you which village the person comes from. They, they're, um, I think they're extremely good in their use of colour. I think these socks are a very good example of this. Uh, they combine colours beautifully, I think. They've got a, a, a very, very good colour sense and they love bright, interesting colours. But in these socks, um, Rafina, who, who knitted these, has used a dark background for a lot of it so that these colours then really stand out against the dark background. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting uh, comparison with Fair Isle is that you do have large patterns with smaller peery type yeah. Yeah. patterns so they call them in Shetland interspersed with them uh, so that's a, a similarity uh, with with the Fair Isle patterns the they love the the natural world so they use uh, llamas they use foxes they use birds that's a stylized bird there uh, they use little animals called viscachas which are, are like little bunnies with long tails and uh, more birds here, hummingbirds. And often the small peary patterns are things like pyramid shapes, mountains, um, streams. They took some patterns from the Spanish. They took the Spanish star. They took patterns of horses because they didn't have horses. Um, so they, they use horses and cattle. Uh, they don't use people very often. Um, they sometimes use a row in this hat that I knitted of rows of interspersed men and women, perhaps in a dancing pattern. But you have people very infrequently. It's usually the natural world. And you never have sheep. Somehow, <laughs> somehow sheep are not thought to be that important, I don't think. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, look, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and um, showing us these beautiful garments. So the ones here that in the more natural dyed fabrics are from your teacher, aren't they? Yes, that's yeah. right. And then the, some of these are mine. This is quite interesting. Um, this is a Bolivian pattern. And the Bolivians in the high Andes, in the area that used to be called Upper Peru, they knit in the same way as well. And this is a bag that I made. And the, the Bolivians like black and white for their patterns. Okay. And this little bag is great because it's got these little pockets to put your money in that you can only access from inside the bag. So nobody can put their fingers in and take take any of your money out. Okay, it's a very being... interesting construction, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it is. A very nice shape as well, I think. Looks like a very large mitten with two <laughs> thumbs. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Okay, so I mentioned in the introduction that you are involved in a Peruvian textile study group. That's right. So what kinds of activities are you doing there? Yes, well, I was extremely fortunate when I came back from Peru that my Spinners and Weavers Guild, which is Cambridgeshire, um, had got a Peru study group just starting up, a Peruvian textile study group, which I joined. And that has been a great source of inspiration over the last few years. Our idea is that we try to learn the actual techniques that they're used in the textiles. And, and so then more appreciate the skill of the artisans. So we have been looking uh, at backstrap weaving. We've made our own backstrap looms and learnt backstrap weaving. 
we've done the cross knit looping, which is the ancient technique I was talking about, and we've done braiding, and of course we've done Peruvian knitting, and we've looked at the spinning, and this has all been a great, uh, a great resource really. And yeah. we each lead, we we learn something, and we we teach each other. We've got some good skills in the group. Yeah. And we're also extremely fortunate that we have been supported by the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge uh, in, in this work. So that has also been a great thing. And, uh, and we now really, truly appreciate the skills of the people in, in Peru and in the Andean Highlands. Well, that sounds great. So we'll put those that contact detail below in case anyone in the area wants yes. to come along and, and, and learn as well. Well, Frankie, thank you so much. It's been really great. It's been great to look at the stuff. It's been great for you to see your demonstrations and learn more about the history of it. Very interesting. So we'll say goodbye to the audience now. Bye. Bye.